Chapter 17 March winds brought new life to Clear Creek. Currents of wind whistled and growled through the trees. Large pines swayed to the east as if wanting to leave their homes. Squirrels appeared in haste, found food, then fled. Nature was evolving. For Clear Creek, memories of Clarissa's escape melted along with the snow. The day after they found her, the sun shone again. Dr. Landerson had restored the resident structure in order. Dr. Gravers had thanked the staff for their additional support, and no one had mentioned Clarissa, or the terror, fear, and flight of that night. Cameron was another pleasant surprise. In the last few weeks, he had abandoned his tattered cap, trimmed his beard, and had actually begun smiling. Unfortunately, Mary Jean and Thomas had shown minimal change in months. As for Maxwell, who had always been the vocal one in the group, he now held back. Instead, his paranoia had set in. He believed the staff intentionally wanted to hold him back. Now, he threatened to voluntarily leave before the completed treatment. However, if he made that choice, his wife said divorce papers would be his only welcome home. She was the rope that kept him tied to Clear Creek. In today's session, John started it off with good news. In front of the group, John pulled a compliment form out of a file. Yesterday, I got a wonderful report from Nurse Nancy about you, Cameron. Almost with shyness, Cameron surveyed the group before looking back at John. You did? She said that on Tuesday, Nurse Erica had to leave in the middle of her shift. You were angry Erica had left. But then when you learned it was an emergency regarding her sick baby, you stopped cursing. Instead, you asked what was wrong with the baby. She said it was an excellent response because you showed concern for someone else. Cameron shared a smile with John. Today, he said, Erica's back. I got to ask about her baby. She said he had a high temperature, but he's doing better now. Great, Cameron. John slid the form back into the file and set his paperwork on the floor. Then he offered a calm smile toward the entire group. Now, before we discuss today's topic, I want to remind you about the field trip this next Friday. Disneyland, Thomas said, his mouth still in a full smirk. Yes, John said. I think almost all of you are scheduled to attend. I'm not. Cassidy stuck out her lower lip. That's true. You haven't been here long enough to earn that opportunity, but hopefully you'll attend the next big activity. John looked at Maxwell, who was looking at the ground. Due to a loss of privileges, he was the other person unable to attend. Will you be there? Rebecca asked John. No, Dale said. Remember, he's got that meeting he has to be at. That's right, John sighed. Think of me in training all day while you enjoy the rides. Dale gave John a quick nod of the head. I'll ride Space Mountain for you, Doc. Who's in charge of us? Cameron asked. That's over the field trip, but Dr. Landison will be there to assist. Plus, your coordinators will be with you. Except for Mary Jean, Arnie, and Rebecca. You'll be with Heather, and then a few extra nurses and aides will be on hand if you need anything. I'm not going, Arnie said. Infestations of germs, rapid-growing poison. That's right, Arnie. I had you taken off the list. You, Maxwell, and Cassidy can either have mostly free time during the day, or you can join up with the East Wing group on the fourth floor. No, Maxwell scowled. That's up to you, John said. Later that day, he had Maxwell's individual therapy session. No doubt this patient would be in another foul mood. We're going to have fun, Rebecca smiled. Her bright eyes seemed to share happiness. John couldn't help but smile back. I'm sure you will. John rubbed his eyes. The clock on his nightstand read 2.53 a.m. He shut both eyes readjusted his body and tried to find comfort in the suddenly hard bed. Why couldn't he stop thinking? Questions kept robbing him of his rest. He was used to losing control of his thoughts during the day, but now also in his sleep? Around 11 p.m., John had climbed into bed only to stare up at the dark ceiling. Sleep became a far-off hope as his mind stayed busy replaying the questions he'd wanted to ask Rebecca the previous day. Frequently, she talked about her life away from Clear Creek. The more she talked about leaving, the more Dr. Landerson's words rang in John's ears. 
she's not the type who can handle transition. She'll go back to where she was. But would she? His hope to find solace in sleep was destroyed. The hours passed slowly as he lay in bed. Occasionally, he shifted his body, hoping to find a comfortable spot that would induce sleep. Something must have worked because he dozed off. But now he was awake again. He rolled onto his right side and opened an eye. 3.20 a.m. He had to get some rest. John tossed his back against the mattress and lay stiff. Had the bed always been this uncomfortable? He had to think about something else, anything. But there was nothing. Every waking minute had been devoted to his job. No, not the job. To Rebecca's progress. The previous afternoon, he'd been tempted to test her. To ask her if she believed in herself. The idea was to find out what she thought, or rather, to see if she could prove through words her strength and commitment to move on. He had given in to his callous desires and asked, So you think you can do this? She had a look of terror on her face as she stated, You said I could. You said you would help me. She had confided in him that she was scared. Of course she was scared. But John had his own set of fears. His plan was to prepare Rebecca sufficiently then show Dr. Landerson that she was ready. But what if his efforts failed? Were his fears comparable to hers? Were they worse? At the conclusion of their session, she had told him what he wanted to hear. She wished to leave Clear Creek. She would do whatever was necessary to accomplish that goal. If Rebecca was willing and ready, then he would be certain he was capable as well. 3.45 a.m., his mind was alert. Sleep was still a far-off dream. He pulled himself out of bed and wandered down the hall to the kitchen. He poured himself a tall glass of milk, then sat at the table. A few minutes had passed before John became aware he was aimlessly scribbling across yesterday's L.A. Times. He continued doodling over a picture of Governor Pete Wilson and Santa Barbara's mayor, Richard Downley. Then he glanced at the caption. It was about the governor's effort to improve highways along the coastline, with the initial effort beginning near Santa Barbara. With his thoughts drifting elsewhere, John picked up the newspaper and flipped through the headlines. There was an additional article about Downley, detailing how his efforts to improve Santa Barbara were benefiting the entire state. There was an interesting editorial on the rise in domestic violence and an update on a lengthy murder trial. John skimmed through a few more articles until a specific one stood out. The first sentence read, Society for Research and Child Development compares mother's interaction and attachment with infant temperament. The attempt to ignore thoughts of Rebecca were useless. He needed to help her, and he would make it so she could succeed. Whatever it required, he was invested. And with this renewed commitment, John took another long drink. But what if Dr. Landerson was correct? Perhaps John's dream for her was too noble, and instead, he was wasting his time. He wanted to offer her a life that was worth having. But was he a miracle worker? How much could he really offer her? He was there to rescue her. At least, that was what he believed. But why her? What was it that made him so devoted to her progress? Was he trying to fix some void in her life? Or some void in his own? Sleep was no longer an option. After he finished the last of his milk, he looked around the kitchen this introspection bothered him. He shut his eyes and leaned against the wood chair. But instead of feeling calm, a sharp sting entered his heart. What if he was making a mistake? Perhaps he was wrong. According to Dr. Landerson, his efforts were unprofessional and weak. But could he withdraw himself from her? Of course that was what he needed to do. Words of caution from staff meetings raced through his mind. Separate yourself. Remove your emotions from your work. Do not allow your patients to become dependent on you. You cannot be their only communal network. Then there was the theory that referred to the biased emotional reaction that a therapist experienced toward a patient in treatment. Was John suffering from this? Was he expressing anxiety and bias based on his interactions with this patient? He had been naive, foolish. He should have seen this coming. Her situation was always on his mind, and he had made no effort to silence its consuming tendency. He needed to change this. This extreme focus was dangerous. But he did care about the quality of her life. He had to see that she was given a chance, 
an opportunity for growth. This had to happen. Otherwise, nothing else mattered.